Okay, so good afternoon to everyone from our staff at Families Canada from Ottawa. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. This is very exciting for us to be hosting a forum where everyone can express comments, experiences they're currently going through and ask questions um, amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this is the first in a series of facilitated online discussion forums that we plan to continue for a while during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we at Families Canada hope that these discussions will help deepen understanding of the impact and effects that this pandemic on Canada's family support sector has. It will be a way for all of us in the sector to connect, to share concerns and challenges, um, but also to learn about some of the good practices that would help to keep our organiz organizations running and serving our clients, especially the most vulnerable members uh, of families. My name is Kate Brown. I'm the Senior Communications um, Officer for Families Canada, and I'll just uh, state a few housekeeping comments uh, before we get started. We have about um, 60 participants at the moment, and we want to avoid, uh, which is a fabulous turnout. Thank you so much for taking the times out of your busy Fridays. Uh, we want to avoid everyone speaking over each other. So we will mute everyone. Uh, we have a chat box on the bottom. And if you would just like to share an experience, make a comment or ask a question, enter into the chat box that you would like to have a turn to speak. And we will call on people in order and I will unmute you as those times come. Uh, so I will now uh, pass the mic over to our president and CEO, Kelly Stone for some opening remarks. Just one moment, Kelly, I will look to find you. Okay, Kelly, the floor is yours. Great, I can see I'm unmuted. So, hi everyone. Um, thanks for joining in today. We thought we would uh, give this a try, as Kate said. Um, and uh, you know, we'll if this is if this is useful to everyone, which we hope it will be, we'll run it for a few weeks to see. Um, and it's it's meant to be casual. Uh, it's it's a chance for us to have a conversation about some of the stuff that is really concerning us. And as such, um, you would be welcome to submit some discussion topics to us as well. Um, we have some in mind, but you might have some too as we go along and you see the kinds of ways that we can make use of this um, national uh, sort of forum. And who knows, maybe it's something we'll, we'll keep doing on a regular basis if we can find we, we make it work over the next uh, few weeks. Um, I mean, w here we are, most of us, I would assume, I can't see everyone, of course, but most of us are working from home at the moment, and we know that social distancing and isolation and quarantine um, is impacting our families and the families that you're supporting in all kinds of different ways. We know that parents, I can see it on my own street outside, parents are, are having to cope um, with a lot of children at home um, from school, as well as potentially either worrying about or caring for older family members, some of whom have been brought home from residences and some that they're having trouble visiting and they're worried about. Um, and it's putting a strain on people's financial resources and if it's not already it's going to very very quickly put a strain on on those resources but also their emotional and um and mental uh well-being as well i mean these are these are really stressful times and and you know better than i do because you're on the front lines that this can have all kinds of consequences in families and we have families living in relatively small spaces with relatively large numbers of family members, and that only exacerbates the situation and creates little hot houses that don't always have um, very positive results. On the other hand, maybe you know, maybe it brings families together, but unfortunately, um, I fear there may be some uh, challenges ahead. And when everyone in your centers are working at home, it's even harder to be supporting families or individual family members when they need it the most. And you certainly are on the front lines of reaching out to these families. 
um, not only, you know, as I say, trying to serve those who are dependent on your um, on your service, but trying to keep your own lights on and your staff paid and their morale high uh, as you're working, as we're all working in these really unusual circumstances. So um, I thought that as a way of sort of starting this, um, we would focus this first forum on business continuity. And there is um, a blog that should go out today that will um, recapture a little bit of our discussion and put some of the, uh, in some different categories, some of, of my thinking, some of it, you know, I mean, these things are, are, are moving on an almost hourly basis. So some, some things that I was uh, musing about have probably already happened in your centers, but maybe there's some other stuff there that you can still be thinking about and we will discuss today. So um, with that, let's move a little bit to business continuity. Um, I would say there's kind of three areas that we have to think about. And one is supporting your own staff. Um, one is, you know, is supporting uh, staff if they're working wholly or partially remotely um, and how to keep the lights on. And then um, what about funded projects, which I think is a, is a really big one, or what about your funders and their expectations in general? I mean, certainly those are the things that we're worrying about right now. So they may have some, um, ring some bells with you as well. Um, I think it probably goes without saying now that you really need to encourage everybody to work from home if they possibly can. Um, and certainly uh, the self-quarantine and working and not coming in if you still have centers open, um, if they're ill, all that sort of thing. I'm sure you have that well in hand at this point. What was helpful is the um, Government of Canada stimulus uh, um, announcement this week uh, put quite a bit of emphasis on employment insurance support um, to assist workers who may not have enough um, sick leave if they're ill or they have to be quarantined. Um, and uh, one thing to keep in mind is uh, if you find you are having to lay off staff, um, be very careful because um, if you have staff that are on sick leave or are quarantined, um, you could be in a lot of difficulty if you had to lay that person off during that time. So. Instead, um, you may need some help with the uh, getting them onto employment insurance, this new employment insurance um, angle as, a, uh, as an alternative, but just be quite careful with that. I don't know all the provisions yet. I'm trying to keep up, but we can get some help if any of you are struggling with this and need some advice. We have some places that we can go to try to get advice for you um, if, if you need it. Um, Ensure your desk books are up to date. That's probably one of the most important things that you could be asking your staff to do right now. And, and we're doing that too. Is these, you know, having a desk book, which is kind of, if, if we used to say, you know, if I get, uh, we would joke, if I get hit by the, you know, avian flu or I get run over our bus tomorrow, then what happens with everything that I do and who would know how to step in? Well, not the joke anymore. Um, who would know how to step in and step in right away? Is there somebody that could do that? So that is kind of two things. One is depth, uh, meaning that more than one person uh, on, a, on a regular basis knows what another person is doing. And the other is having really good desk books, which are the how-tos with passwords and, and numbers of clients and phone numbers of uh, phone numbers or, or texts or whatever of, of, um, of clients, uh, names, uh, phone trees, all that sort of stuff, but particularly related to the work that they do. And if you have staff at home now, that's a very good project for them to be undertaking is to un update their desk book right to the minute right now. And I can tell you my staff are, are doing that uh, as we speak, literally. And in some cases, um, individuals uh, have to contribute to more than one desk book related to, say, a particular project where two or three people are involved in different pieces. And so they're all updating that, that desk book in the event that somebody does get sick or can't work even remotely we're able to keep the trains running as, as much as possible. So that's really important at this particular time. Um, and it will help 
maintain your your business continuity and again uh in terms of looking after your staff you know i'm sure you guys have all got the hand washing stuff and the happy birthday song and um there's great uh, youtube videos on how to wash your hands and i worked at the public health agency for years and thought that i knew how to do this and then i was watching somebody on television on cbc showing you how to do this and i thought well maybe not <laughs> and so i think uh, we could all learn how to uh, how to wash our hands and in uh, like surgeons. So uh, maybe find those YouTubes and actually pay attention to them because it's an old public health agency person. I actually wasn't doing it correctly. Um, if you still have staff uh, working in your offices, um, consider some stand up meetings in the morning so that everybody feels a little bit of a, a, a team spirit because we're working in such unusual times. Or maybe your stand-up is a virtual stand-up and you do a five-minute meeting in the morning if you're working off of a system like we are. We're just learning how to use Teams, uh, which is part of our Office 365 suite of um, software programs. Um, so we're, we haven't quite got it down to a science yet, but we are learning this week. We thought we might have a couple of weeks to learn, but surprise, um, just after we decided we all had to go remote and now we're all learning to do teams but you can have a quick virtual meeting which kind of covers the basics for the day and keeps everybody up to date and keeps your your team spirit alive which i think is half of the battle at the moment so we all feel like we're um we're in it together uh, access to mental health supports this will be presumably a, a local or a provincial territorial thing um, there's no doubt that COVID-19 is creating anxiety, anxiety for, for individuals, uh, which are employees or family members. Um, and we need to have a, a roster of places that people can go or people, others that people can speak to if they're really feeling a lot of stress. And that might be you, but it might be somebody else in your community. So it's good for your staff to have those kinds of support numbers close at hand if they're not already. Um, also, basic stuff like just keeping a friendly um, lifeline available for uh, your own family um, and neighbors that might need a bit of help or some taxi service, but also um, some of your, um, your community, um, the families in your community that may be really stuck. I think that's um, something that we can all do as a, from a human perspective. So moving into the what happens if my staff are all working at home issue, um, is it even possible? Well, mostly, of course, the answer is yes, and, and many of you will already be doing that, but that doesn't mean it's going to be really easy. So um, we have been busy thinking about the capacity of our staff to work at home, and that is, do they have laptops? Do they have home computers? Do they have proper internet access? Um, do they have old computers that don't have built-in cameras and audio? And how do we sort of manage all of that uh, to make it as easy as possible for people to work at home? And one of the issues, for example, that we dealt with was um, how would we manage with people who don't have landlines anymore and are using cell phones, which can be very expensive, to make their regular calls. Well, Skype does a very good job at this. So you can put very cheap credits onto Skype, $10 onto Skype and Skype is free. And people can use Skype to make both local and international telephone calls at, at almost no cost at all. So if your staff don't have unlimited calling on their cell phones, that's a very cheap way of helping them to subsidize their telephone bills. Um, we are also using uh, Zoom, as you can see here, and there are some um, quite good uh, Zoom um, webinars around at the moment, because I guess a lot of people are turning into Zoomers, uh, and they are really helpful in, in teaching you the basics if you don't use Zoom now, and you can get Zoom for free. We have a Zoom license, which allows us, for example, in this case, to have many more subscribers, but you can run 40-minute uh, meetings with 100 subscribers for free on, on Zoom. Uh, you just sign up. It's, it's a no-brainer, and you're on. There's all kinds of things it can do, but you can just run the basics very easily, um, super helpful, uh, without doing anything um, dramatic. And again, uh, you may just want to be organizing your regular phone-in chats, both with your staff and perhaps with, with your clients as well, if they 
or your families if um, if they actually have internet at home. So let's talk about IT security for a second. Uh, how is your IT security? Um, one of the first things that you should be thinking about is asking your staff who are working at home to get to download as an app a virtual private network if they don't already have one. Um, there's lots of VPNs. I use VPN Express, but there's lots of them out there that are quite good. They can cost a little bit of money, but you can usually put a whole bunch of devices in a household on one of these things. And if you have staff that are working on sensitive documents, either sensitive from a, um, a, a family uh, client sort of um, perspective with their records or finance or HR, then they absolutely should have a virtual private network or a VPN because this is hacker paradise folks, uh, everybody can break into to our, sorry, can break into our, um, our lines uh, and get all of our information if we don't have VPNs because we're all working at home. So it's the akin to doing your banking at Starbucks, you know, and all those people around can potentially uh, hack in and have a look at your bank account. And so for those of you who don't have a VPN, just look it up. Uh, in the Play Store, VPN. Uh, mine is VPN. Mine is Express VPN. It's a little red symbol thing. That's one of many, but, but do consider getting that. The other thing is that for those of you who have Windows 10, um, go into your security and make sure that your antivirus control is on because, again, you're quite exposed. But Windows 10 has a really good antivirus uh, if um, if you're on uh, Windows 10, just you have to be sure that it's turned on and it doesn't cost anything. If you have older Windows systems, uh, you might need to purchase um, an antivirus app. But again, a really good idea in a time when those hackers out there know that we have all gone to remote work. So um, consider um, how you're going to help your your staff with respect to internet and I mentioned cell phone as well you know if you're going to uh, subsidize them um, how are you going to help them with uh, home devices um, and their any um, expenses additional expenses that they might have for for working at home uh, it's it's best to create a little bit of a policy on the common stuff that people will be using at home so that everyone is treated the same way. And, and again, frankly, it's something we hadn't thought about. Lots of our people work at home a day here and a day there, but we had no policy saying, okay, if you work X number of days in a month, we're going to subsidize your basic internet, for example. Or we're going to pay you by the page if you have to do printing at home because we realize it costs for paper and printer cartridges. But these are some things that we should be thinking about and maybe developing a little bit of a common policy now while we, we have the time, because if this goes on, it's, it's going to come up. And finally, um, in the IT security side, ask your internet provider if you have sufficient bandwidth for everyone to be working at home without your systems crashing unexpectedly. If you, have, if you are working in the cloud, it's not a problem. But if you, um, if you are not, then um, ask about bandwidth and also ask about backups. Make sure that your, your system is being backed up a couple of times a day with your service provider, either in onto a hard drive or onto the cloud, because now is certainly not the time when you want to be losing your materials. Uh, so the last one I want to touch on was what about funded projects? And this is one that's really causing us a lot of angst at the moment too, because as you might imagine, we have all kinds of funded projects and some of you are deeply involved in these. And we're trying to figure out what can be carried on, uh, what uh, can be postponed or what will have to be canceled outright. And this might be small things that you're doing at the community level, or it might be really big projects that you're involved in with another partner. Um, I guess the good news is that we're all in this together, which means funders are in this together too. And even government funders don't want to see large amounts of money lapsed at the end of the year. So although it feels like they're, to me anyway at the moment, that they're uh, paralyzed and they're not doing anything, they are going to have to figure this out. 
So what we want to be doing as a community and as not-for-profits generally is poking them a little bit with really good suggestions and questions which are going to force these issues up beyond project managers uh, into the, the more senior levels of government where they'll be getting it from all sides and they will in fact be forced to have to deal with some of these issues. Because some of our projects are going to be really difficult to advance in the short term if they have face-to-face uh, -face. and we need mitigation strategies and we need flexibility from our funders for everything from what if we have to reorganize this project and put all the human stuff at the end of the project, for example, which will impact our reports which uh, against project activities, which impacts our, our payment. Um, what happens if we lapse? either the first quarter or maybe at the end of next fiscal year because of what happened in the first quarter. These are questions to be putting to your funders now. And again, the good news is that I'm reading that some fairly influential folks um, are doing this on behalf of all of us as well, such as Imagine Canada, which is uh, very influential with the federal government. And they're writing these kinds of collective questions up to the federal government now and some not-for-profit associations like the one in Ontario are writing them to the Ontario government and they are exactly the same questions as you and I would have it's just they have thought about some helpful language which if you um, if you look at what might pay attention to what's being written up on your own feeds which you may get use some of their language because it can be helpful even in writing your own MP or MPP or actually your funder um, I think this is something that we should get a jump on to put some pressure on our funders because it won't be very long before projects have, uh, have delays ahead of them. So um, I guess the, the last thing again on, on projects um, is desk books again. Make sure that you have those desk books and that they are completely up to date on any projects that you have because unfortunately the chances are that some of us are going to get sick. So we need to be sure that another person can easily step in behind with as little drama as possible. Um, now the, the next uh, thing that uh, beyond um, business continuity is um, we want to move to the open plenary, which I'll let Kate moderate, um, where we talk about uh, some of the business continuity issues that you might be facing that maybe we can help or maybe we can just discuss and some of the things that you've done that might be helpful to the rest of us because we are very interested in sharing uh, best practices uh, um, from one side of the country to the other. Kate? Thank you, Kelly. Hello, everyone. So, um Based on the topics that Kelly has mentioned, we're now opening the floor to discussion, uh, comments, questions, um, experiences that you're going through, anything you'd like to share amongst the group. Um, this is a supportive space that we've cultivated here and continu will continue to cultivate. Um, yeah, so just uh, mention in the, I have a Zoom group chat thing open. If you wanted to um, enter your name, or that you would like to speak, it shows your name, I can unmute you and then we can start the discussion. So I'm really interested in hearing what challenges you have facing you right now. Are all your staff uh, working remotely or are some of you still doing a bit of 50-50? I, I just like to hear that as a starting point. Oh, you, Kate, any, anybody? <laughs> no, so I'm going to unmute everyone. And if you would like to speak up, feel free to do so. Just a moment. Okay. Or is open for anyone to speak into their microphones. Oh, hi, it's hi. Brenda. Hi, Brenda. Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, I just put a note up um, on the chat. I forgot I can, I can actually speak. Um, but anyway, I mean, one of the things that I'm kind of grappling with is that my, um, my staff is primarily on the floor and not really technically savvy. Um, but also uh, a funder has suggested that we um, move from service into outreach. 
family outreach and I'm, I'm kind of um, grappling with how that might be done effectively. It's Kelly. I'm really interested to what some of the rest of you might think about that. Is anybody moving from service to outreach right now? And how are you managing this? Uh, one of the things we did at our center is we just did um, family calls. All the staff took, we had phone numbers for everybody. And we just did family check-ins. Hi, how are you doing? We're not in the center, but leave a message. We're monitoring our voicemails if anybody really needs anything. And they really appreciated that. And it made a bit of a difference in their day. Yeah. So were you actually in the center to do that? No, we did it from our home. It, my, my worry was about using people's personal mm -hmm. phones, but I suppose um, if Skype is an option, maybe if, if we use Skype, I know you mentioned that, Kelly, does huh? that just go straight to a landline then? Um, Skype, you Skype can, can go to any phone. Um, Skype, you don't have, they, they cannot call you on Skype. Right. But you know, they, you can call them on Skype. So you could return their call to any phone whatsoever on Skype. Uh, and Skype is super easy to use to sign up for Skype. And you have a, a, a phone pad and you dial in the number and it, it rings like any number, only you're speaking through your computer. And, you know, sure, it's, it's not always as perfect and, and quality as a phone line would be, but it's pretty darn good and very inexpensive. Some of the concerns with privacy is you can take your phone and block your number when you're calling out. Oh, okay. So all that's of good. my staff yeah. have, that's their main phone, so they have unlimited calling, but you can make a call if you go into your settings and change it so that your phone number doesn't come up. Oh, good. Okay, good to know. Oh, good tip. As well as Facebook, as we've been putting postings on Facebook. <clears throat> That's good. Okay. I just wanted to step in here and point out a, a good comment from Christine, and who is saying another challenge is that our social enterprise involves face-to-face contact, and as such, is shut down until further notice. We will be without that income on half our annual budget for an undetermined amount of time. Wow. <laughs> Is there a way that we can mute, but then people can um, maybe put their hand up or something to sure. Yeah, I to can talk. I can mute. Everyone here is now muted, and I will just call on people from the comments section. Um, so uh, let's see. I can still hear. Okay, everyone is now muted. So, so I have a question from Emma Feinblit to everyone. Is anyone doing food bank or hamper pickup delivery? What are best practices to do this safely? Kelly, if you would like to take a stab at that one. Well, um, I'm no hamper expert. Oops, there we go. I'm not a, uh, a food hamper expert, but um, I think that uh, if that can be done, uh, the food banks here are, uh, are delivering it to people's front doors and are just leaving it, neither ringing the bell or, or leaving. Um, I don't know if, if that's possible, uh, but uh, I would be, if, you're, if you haven't done this before, I would be inclined to be in touch with your local food bank um, because there are sort of groups that are coming together to try to um, um, fill out the food bank. You know, bakeries that are otherwise closed, for example, in Ottawa are baking like mad for food banks and taking donations for, for basic uh, ingredients. And so there's kind of new things that are available for food banks because otherwise um, food banks are, are struggling. I have another great comment here, a helpful tip via for Zoom from Lisa Mills. Um, so she's a frontline worker 
and she will be offering a music circle and a story time through Zoom each day for, for our families. Uh, we start oh. today. That's a fabulous idea. I have Carmen here who says, my colleague in Saskatchewan is starting a Facebook Nobody's Perfect Parent group. She is going to share how that goes in a week or so with me. It will be a closed group, not a Facebook Live session. Interesting. Yep, both of those are great ideas. What about privacy concerns? I have Brenda here. I think Zoom is great for certain activities, but there are privacy concerns that we need to keep in mind. Is that not true? Uh, is, I mean, well, I'm not quite sure the heart of the question. Is it that we might be oversharing via Zoom? In which case, yes, that is, that is gonna be a problem anytime we're working virtually, but um, it, it is, it is always um, a, a closed group because it is by invitation on Zoom. So it's not as though someone who isn't part of the group could be part of that um, invitation. Uh, I mean, in this call, it's, it's more open because we are posting it to all of our members, um, but unless people can, um, are mentioning the, the names of individual uh, individuals, um, I, I don't really see where privacy would be an issue. It, um, if you're talking about a Zoom call that is an internal call, there is the ability to record that call, um, but that is intended for minutes and, and things like that. But I mean that you control the who participates in the call in the first place. Yes, Christine here did mention that people can, can uh, record a Zoom call. Uh, participants or admin. Um, Diane Elliott, uh, privacy is more of an issue for parenting programs. How secure is a private Facebook group? Um, that, that I, I know less about the privacy on Facebook and to be perfectly honest, I would trust the privacy of Facebook a little bit less. <laughs> um, I think uh, Zoom is, um, is, is probably more secure than because it is much more controlled than than a Facebook group. But I, I'm not an expert in security. But just um, from a kind of a visceral point of view, I would be a little concerned about Facebook if it's truly privacy that you're worried about. Okay. Anyone else with experiences, questions, comments? Uh, from Rebecca, has anyone had a successful story using Facebook that they would like to share? And Carmen here says, I think that for Facebook, um, I think they will choose or Zoom, they will choose to enter the group so they know what they are signing up for. And I think that's, that's correct. That's right. Um, you know, this it is a virtual environment uh, and certainly we all know the challenges that Facebook has had in terms of privacy uh, and and I think they've you know in the US there's been some pretty hard discussion about this and probably it's better than it was but um, I think it's a bit of buyer beware but also there isn't a lot of other options out there except these virtual um, methods that we that we can share that are free and you know zoom is one um skype is another you can use skype video as well uh and of course um facebook emma has a great question here what to do with child care assistants receptionists etc who don't have much admin work to do from home should we reduce their hours um i think that's a that is a real problem um i mean frankly you know we've thought about that too uh and no one wants to lay off staff or reduce hours of staff at this particular time although at least now we have an unusual um, um employment insurance uh net that we didn't have before that will go beyond 
just people who are ill or quarantined. I understand it, it will be for um, people that are laid off and they will be able to apply much more quickly, although I don't think all of the details of that have been worked out nor if they've been released yet, but there is that. You know, I guess you have to think about what else can those staff do in your center uh, that's outside of their normal duties in order to help this situation. Um, you know, if we're all kind of in this together, what what can that person do to be further supporting the team or perhaps getting ahead of some some issues that you um, will want to pursue once this is over? I, I guess it's a question of creativity as much as um, you can make their time valuable and you can afford to keep paying them. Yeah, we have Christine here commenting on that, saying we are continuing to pay folks their regular wage, even though the regular work is changing and the hourly requirement for work is changing. Not long, ha not sure how long we can sustain that, though. Yeah, I would just comment too that we are asking our staff to be a lot more flexible. Um, you know that life may, when you're when you're working at home. I mean, no one is sitting at their dining room table from 7.30 in the morning till three or four in the afternoon with a, you know, a precise 40 minute, half an hour, whatever break for lunch and for coffee, it's just not gonna happen. So it means that as people get into this rhythm, people are working at different times, some early or some late, according to what works in their families, especially if they have children at home. But we are saying, look, this is the, the expectation is that you give us a certain number of hours, which is we work on a kind of two week flex hour um, perspective anyway, so that if people are working more than their day, they can make the time up or, or, or be off um, later on. And, and we can still do that. But it also in this case means that, you know, a seven and a half hour day may be stretched out in different ways for people. And there has to be more um, uh, kind of on time availability through, you know, if maybe you're not signed into your computer all day, but somebody can text you and say, I really need you to be part of this, you know, Zoom call at three o'clock, or can you help me with this or help me with that? And it's off hours. Um, it's not like three in the morning, but but it's off hours. And we have to not get too fluffed about that and, and be able to respond to it. And again, realize that, you know, it, it's going to be different and timelines are going to be different. And we are finding that's a little harder for some people to get their minds wrapped around. And, you know, we're just, we're all getting through this. I have Sharon here who would like to make a comment. Sharon, you are currently un trying to unmute you. You should be able to yeah. speak now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Um, so I supervise a center and I have uh, two staff that are now working from home and I know that uh, we've talked about ways to connect with families. I just, I have a fundamental um, bias against toddlers and kids sitting in front of the computer. So what I've done is I've um, worked with my staff to enhance their circle. They're going to be learning new songs, learning new stories, learning new movements. And then what I'm doing is creating a song, song book that I'm putting out there on our Facebook page for the parents so the parents can then learn along with the team so that when we do reopen in the center, both the team will have these new enhancements for circle time and the parents are working on those at home with their children. Um, so they're also creating new um, activities and new things and, uh, for the, I sent them home with material. So they're actually um, creating new things, but I'm also at the same time sending those kinds of suggestions for at home activities home to the parents so that they can look around the house for the things that they have and create new um, new ways to engage with their child. So I'm trying to be kind of the bridge between so that I'm not setting families up with more screen time, but giving them more opportunities to connect with their kids in ways and then also giving my team um, the time and the resources and the flexibility to enhance their skill set um, while we're not together physically. Thank you, Shannon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sharon, that sounds great. It sounds like you're you're really on top of this. And I think um, the kinds of activities that that we are working on uh, is probably a, a whole other subject that we can put um, going forward. I mean, m many of us are just sort of sorting that out now, but I'd really like to get into that in future so that we can we can share that back and forth. And I think there is a kind of tricky line between 
screen time and increasing screen time, especially for toddlers right now, and um, still maintaining some social connects for families and for toddlers in creative ways. And it doesn't mean that they're sitting in front of the screen watching an animated video or something, but it might mean that we, we create um, uh, virtual uh, groups where, where there is some, uh, through Facebook perhaps, there is some activities which we are all doing together at the same time that is facilitated through a screen but isn't actually forcing the, the child to be against, to be um, watching the screen with, with the parent. So we have to think about how to do that. Um, but I really like the idea of creating activities that the parents can do with the kids on their own uh, and songs that you're suggesting um, that would be available for parents. I mean, that kind of stuff is just gold. It's, it's really, really good. And I would like to have a, a session where we just are sharing that kind of stuff. Really great ideas that we're coming up with. I have a question posed to the group at large from Corey. We have a large number of families that attend our programs on a weekly basis. For example, over 2,000 parents and caregivers on our email. Oh. Does anyone have any suggestions on how to do outreach slash support to a large number of participants? Thanks. Anybody suggesting, Kate? <laughs> Um, not so far. I think that's a really tough one. Um, I, you know, I think again, we we're going to have to probably get creative with um, uh, with virtual programs. The problem is, I I recognize not everyone has internet at home, and they may not even have a smartphone at home. It may be just a simple phone. So, um, you know, part. Uh, encouraging them uh, to participate in any kind of social outreach would be really difficult, but uh, even on a one-on-one, -on -one, I mean, I don't know how you, you do phone calls. You might have to do um, random you know, selection in a week uh, of, of calls to different families to kind of keep in touch, but I'd be really interested to see how, how others might be um, struggling or, or, or um, dealing with this particular challenge. <laughs> I've had a couple of people here mention MailChimp sendouts. Mm -hmm. um, so I have, uh, for example, from Sylvia Hopkins here, we are continuing to send out a daily email with topics that we would have discussed in the drop-in. For example, an activity, a song, a snack idea, and a game they can do with their child. The guest speakers are sending information directly to Sylvia which she can then send to the families. So they now send the info from child mind directly to parents regarding anxiety or how to talk to your children about what is happening. So email blasts, a great idea. MailChimp, you can have up to 2000 email lists for free or email addresses for free to go out in your blasts. Good ideas, folks. What else have we got out there? So Gloria to everyone has said that she uh, usually does part-time one-on-one tutoring in family homes, but during this challenging time, I've now turned to online tutoring with some families if possible. She's been using Zoom and it's been working well. That's great. Uh, from Emma, I'm thinking about families without phones or internet at home. It seems like that is a pretty much essential during these times. Has anyone heard of any initiatives to get people free or subsidized phones or internet? I have not. I have not. Um, I think that that's something on a, um, perhaps on a provincial or even local basis that you might be asking tech companies to help with at this time. So if you have a tech company in your city, uh, I'd be hitting them up for um, laptops or perhaps your, your cable company, your Rogers or Bell or whomever it is, I would be asking them if they might consider some, some either free or subsidized internet for uh, families that can't afford it that are now becoming socially isolated. But I think that would work better on a local basis. 
Uh, we also have Nadine who said that we are also using our blog to share ideas and resources for parents, which is great. Yeah. And Brenda, um, hearkening back to the comments about family uh, internet and phones for families without them, would that not be considered the cost of doing business in a different service model? Um, well, I guess it, it would, it could certainly, um, but I'm still not sure, Brenda, how you would see paying for that. Oh, she so was is that to staff, not families? Oh, okay, to staff. Okay, yeah, yeah. So for staff, Carmen, for sure. Carmen on the same subject has said in northern Manitoba they don't have internet or cell range. Faxing is the way to connect with them at the centers. Now there's nothing. Ah, oh, wow. I have uh, Zindu who has her hand raised. So, Zindu, I believe you are unmuted. Hey, thanks, Kate. Yeah, just on that note of working with families who don't have access to internet, uh, we have been thinking about that under one of our projects. Um, so what we've been looking at is, you know, most families, even if they don't have access to internet, uh, many do have uh, no ordinary phones, Androids, not smartphones. Uh, so there are some uh, free SMS mass communicating services that you know you could use uh, in the meantime even if it is just to send out uh, you know some factual information to your clients or um, just uh, keeping up some kind of contact uh, the, there are sms uh, services which have just slipped my mind but we can actually uh, you know look into it and maybe put that up on uh, our twitter or something uh, in, in the near future Thank you, Zindu. Yeah, that's a that's a really good idea, Zindu. I had forgotten about that, and um, yeah, really important possibility is is even you know it's all kinds of things that we might be able to do with uh, with text uh, if we could uh, make use of a service like that. We also have uh, a comment from Tina. I heard that WhatsApp is a good communication forum, and the answer is yes, but you have to have Wi-Fi. For WhatsApp, but you could have Wi-Fi in Starbucks, <laughs> and but not Starbucks is open. That's a bad example. What's open these days? Gee, um, in terms of uh, community-based uh, internet, that's actually I hadn't even thought about that. But all of the places one might go to get community-free internet are probably closed at the moment. But for staff, for sure, um, who, anybody who has uh, Wi-Fi. WhatsApp works uh, works very well, and I, I believe you can use it on cell. Too, but it would um, it would chew down your your cell data. I have a question from B Nicholas. How uh, many of our families are in hotels? How do you service them? Hmm. Gosh, I don't know. Is anybody else facing that? Um, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that one. I would need to know from somebody who has some experience with that. While you guys think that one over, I have a great resource from Lisa Mills uh, for young children that was designed for children on the spectrum. It's called My Name is Coronavirus, and you can find it at www.mindheart.co. If anyone has... Um, children with whom they deal with that are on the spectrum. That's a great resource. Thank you, Lisa. Hmm. That is good. Okay, I'm just being mindful of the time here. Do we have any final questions, comments, or experiences before we move to wrapping up this session? I would just uh, hope that, that, oh yeah, hotels should have Wi-Fi. There we go. That's a good suggestion. Yeah, hotels should have free Wi-Fi. In most cases, they will have free Wi-Fi. So sure, um, that is, and I would be interested in anybody else that has um, families in hotels that they are working with and any creative ways that uh, they're, they're supporting them. And perhaps, again, that's something that we can think about and, um, and specifically address as, a, as an issue, uh, families in difficult situations like that um, on a future call. Okay, I think that's all the questions, comments, and experiences we have time for today. So I'll move to Kelly for the wrap-up comments. 
Yeah, well, um, pretty straightforward. Thanks so much for, for joining today. Um, we really hope that uh, this was useful and it's just a start. Uh, we have to get used to chatting with one another in these circumstances. And of course, we have to get used to the best way to handle that conversation from a technology perspective. Um, we will announce our next um, discussion forum and topics, although we would welcome your topics because you may be able to cover uh, a, gr a couple of them um, each time and a date. Um, stay safe, everybody, and uh, keep in touch.